Our graduate school professor, Ed Soja, who wrote Third Space, tried to use the blackboard in our classroom one evening to explain to us the power of multidimensional thinking and the folly of linear narrative as a way of understanding reality. He told us that our thinking was severely constrained, even hamstringed by reliance on reading and writing that always went from left to right, or if you spoke Hebrew or Arabic, right to left, same argument, from up to down on a two-dimensional surface and that told stories that always had a defined beginning, middle, and end. Soja, who was a geographer, said that we couldn't train our minds to comprehend and work within the complexity of even three-dimensional space using two-dimensional thinking. The irony was that he was teaching us these concepts by writing on a two-dimensional blackboard. When we pointed this out to him, he laughed and he said, yes, I admit the medium doesn't support the message. That will be for your generation to complete. Well, now we have the technology to create the third space that Soja wrote about, and more all the time. Most teachers aren't using it, but we have had it for decades. And that's nothing new. What is new is the ability to finally immerse ourselves and our lessons in third space, and fourth space, and fifth space. That isn't exactly new either, as every video gamer knows, but educators are finally beginning to embrace it. Now back in 2010, I was invited to give a talk at the FMX Hollywood Special Effects 5D Conference in Stuttgart, Germany. I shared a stage with leaders in the film and video game industries, but was unfortunately the only educator there. What I showed was work I had started in Egypt, taking the Google Earth coordinates and maps of my adopted neighborhood and communities, and then models done by local architects from the Agathon Trust for Culture, and putting them into Google SketchUp, and then importing them into the Elder Scrolls game engine so I could play my neighborhood as an avatar, and then embellish my apartment in the local garbage recycler school with solar hot water systems I built in the open source mesh modeler Blender 3D. It took a while to make all the softwares work together, but the results were promising. A decade later, Blender has become much easier to use and much more powerful while retaining its free, open-source nature, and powerful free-to-use game engines have appeared like Unity 3D and Unreal Engine 4, and user content creation websites like Roblox now enable school kids around the world to create their own games and share them instantly with other players everywhere. I took the Rosebud Continuum Sustainability Center where I live off grid in Land O'Lakes and made my own version of it in Roblox. And my seven-year-old daughter, who lives in Germany, not only meets me there and plays with me, but joins me in Roblox Studio in real time, like using a Google Doc shared, and helps me create new sustainability playgrounds in the game. She's learning about real solar and wind and biogas and recycling technologies through interactive play in the game and understands their application to the real world because she's visited the real Rosebud and has a place of emotional investment to tie her fantasies to. We put signage in the game to annotate the exhibits and the game becomes a low-cost form of augmented reality for future planning. Now the great thing about Roblox and Unreal Engine and Unity is that I can hook our HTC Vive VR goggles and hand controllers up to it, and we can visit the virtual Rosebud in fully immersive and interactive ways and explore it together as if we were together, though we are thousands of miles away. What makes playing our way to sustainability with our children and our students and indeed anybody better than simply working on it in the real world? It isn't just the safety factor. For experiments in sustainable living can certainly be done in the real world with proper safeguards in place. Lowering the risks in other ways is of course a factor. Today's computers can do simulations with very low investment before money and time and labor and land are committed to a project. And games are fun, so they maintain interest and enthusiasm. But there's something else about them that makes them ideal for sustainability studies. Ironically, it is the inherent limitations of games that makes them useful analogs of reality, just as simplified maps make navigation easier and caricatures can make a personality type easier to understand and relate to. Science always uses limited reductionist models of the world to render it comprehensible, for reality is far too complex and messy for the human mind to understand and work with. Such working models leave out unnecessary details and focus on parameters that are easier to manipulate. 
We augment the salient relevant parts of the data and ignore the less important granularity. We separate the signal from the noise, being careful not to leave out too much, hopefully. Now, fortunately, games are constantly dancing between those levels of detail and abstraction, and the measure of their success is usually how fun or playable they are. The wonderful and almost paradoxical thing about using games to play our way to sustainability is that we can use the inherent inefficiency that game rules depend on in order to make our operations ever more efficient in the real world. We can use limitations to overcome limitations. By striving to achieve utopia within very rigid rules and inefficiencies in the game, we give ourselves the chance to work through such inefficiencies in the real world. And isn't that half the battle in the quest for sustainability? Finding ways to improve efficiency so there isn't any more waste, pollution, or loss? Bernard Suits had the grasshopper say on page 37 that, quote, Games are goal-directed activities in which inefficient means are intentionally chosen. For example, in racing games, one voluntarily goes all around the track in an effort to arrive at the finish line instead of sensibly coming straight across the field. On page 48 and 49, the grasshopper tells his student Skepticus, quote, to play a game is to attempt to achieve a specific state of affairs pre-lucery goal, using only means permitted by rules, the lucery means, where the rules prohibit the use of more efficient in favor of less efficient means, constitutive, uh, constitutive rules, and where the rules are accepted just because they make possible such activity, the lucery attitude. Now it qualifies again, the lucery attitude is necessary so that one's goal is not mandated by bureaucratic demands or for some selfish benefit. Perhaps that makes all the difference. Reality is broken precisely because the pursuit of sustainability is so often impeded by the egotistical and selfish motives of certain entities or groups or by ill-conceived regulations and paperwork. How do you even start to conceive of a given sustainability project or outcome when people immediately say, but that might be against the regulations or building code, or my housing association would object, or we can't make any money doing that, or it isn't economically feasible. In the game world, you can deal with each limitation as a challenge to overcome and find ways around it because that is the very nature of games. Now, Suits argues that, quote, playing games is a central part of the ideal of human existence, and so games belong at the heart of any vision of utopia, end quote. But I'm suggesting that besides being something we want to include in any great society, games are useful because far from being pure flights of fancy and fantasy, games are all about imposing challenges. This is where their form of thinking out loudest has a distinct advantage over the moving pictures we use to think out louder and the books and paintings we use to think out loud. When we thought loudly through speaking, writing, and making movies, we took people on a journey of uncertain mental limitations. Even though, even, even though the media we used had limitations. Strangely, the 2D worlds of text and film constrained certain kinds of expression, but in their Cartesian linearity, they dragged people into whatever fictional world they wanted with no opportunity to affect the narrative or interact with it. This made it hard to distinguish some fantasies and fictions from realistic possibilities, as the stories led the witness to the author's inevitable conclusion, and by foreclosing the opportunity for us to interact, imposed no limitations to be overcome. With interactive 3D gaming and the augmentation of reality, now we see that dealing with limitations and inefficiencies is precisely what makes the games fun and interesting. In games, we solve puzzles. The nonlinear, open-ended, multi-dimensional nature of games, which permit more degrees of freedom in play, but constrain that play through built-in and agreed-upon challenges, called the rules of the game, makes them ideal for solving what we call in the real world, wicked problems. Remember that a wicked problem, as Wikipedia defines it, is a problem that is difficult or impossible to solve because of incomplete, contradictory, and changing requirements that are often difficult to recognize. It refers to an idea or problem that cannot be fixed where there is no single solution to the problem. The use of the term wicked here has come to denote resistance to resolution rather than evil. Another definition is, quote, a problem whose social complexity means that it has no determinable stopping point, end quote. 
Moreover, because of complex interdependencies, the effort to solve one aspect of a wicked problem may reveal or create other problems." End quote. Now, most environmental injustices are the result of classical wicked problems. But the tools are now all here for scientists, engineers, planners, economists, NGOs, philanthropists, artists, teachers, students, you, to make your own roadmaps of varying complexity to navigate that complexity through customizable simplifications and annotations. New data visualization and digital annotation and augmentation tools help us to see the different solutions in different contexts. And now we have the ability to make simulation games out of all of these data and play through every possibility and limitation. Using them in gaming environments gives us the motivation and context for working through their complexities without getting stuck or discouraged. After all, who doesn't like a good boss battle? Game on.